Hello everybody, I am Sami, and today I will uh, present this tutorial about uh, Beyond Neural Search and hands-on building multimodal solution with Gene AI. Um, first, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Sami, I'm a machine learning engineer on Gene AI. And let me introduce Gene AI. So uh, it's my company. We are an uh, open source company um, funded in, uh, during the pandemic uh, 2020, uh, around 50 members distributed across four continents, mainly based in Europe, but we have office in uh, China and the US. Uh, we raised a total of uh, 38 million and we are a top tier AI company according to the three uh, number. Um, we have uh, multiple um, uh, open source projects uh, and we have like an ecosystem around multimodal application and uh, neural search and today I will mainly talk about uh, Docker and Gina, uh, our two of our open source projects. So in this talk I will uh, talk about neural search, um, creative AI, um, so multimodal AI in general, and I will uh, introduce you uh, the Gina tech stack a little bit. Um, explain you what is DALI flow, tools that we have been building using our tech stack and uh, we will finish with uh, tutorials and uh, hands-on when we will, if you have a laptop, we'll be able to, to create some uh, generative AI application and deploy on the cloud. Okay, so let's start with um, what is neural search? And neural search is basically a search powered by machine learning and especially deep learning. So, first example is a traditional search will be a key, a keyword based search when you search for a word, let's say in a book, and you will search for similar other word. Uh, with neural search, you can search with paragraph, you can search with semantic, you can ask uh, a, a question and looking for something really precise, and it will not only look at the, key, at the word, but try to understand your sentence. Uh, as a human will do, like a human who already read the book can search for you the book. Uh, with Gina, you can build such a solution in a couple of, of, of lines. But neural search is not only about text search. Actually, it's, it's more than text, uh, text search. It's a uh, multimodal search. It means that you can search with a different kind of modality. For example, on an on, on a, on a, on a e-commerce uh, shop, you can search for products. Uh, you can search for T-shirt on the e-commerce shop, and it will not only look at the keyword or like the tags in the product. It will look at the image, looks at the description, and you can look for um, a given uh, a T-shirt with a kind of logo on it, a Coca-Cola logo for it, for example. And it will be able to analyze the image and look for the Coca-Cola logo in the image, and it will use different kind of modality, as I said, the image, the description. Same again with our, with our open source project, you can uh, create such an application in, in a couple of lines. Um, other example of uh, neural search would be something like a text to image sequence, so either GIF search or video, directly video, but for example you can imagine a solution where um, people are looking for GIF and they just want just give the description, for example uh, a man wearing a, a suit and, and it will like uh, bring you an image of of, of such a man based on the image. Uh, other example, three D image look like actually we have we have like a, there is a company which is using our, our open source tools to to create an extension for a video game engine when a, devo um, a game developer can like looks for three D image and like look for similar three D image like uh, in in a store like and to increase the productivity so that they can easily find other uh, relevant three uh, D objects. So this is what is neural search, is deep learning powered information retrieval on uh, multimodal and cross-modal data. And just to give you a small, uh, like we, uh, when I say multimodal, I'm talking about image, text, uh, but even audio, uh, video, and uh, unstructured data, uh, every kind of, of data that you can imagine. And this is what neural search can do, is like connect all of the dots. You can stay at, in, inside the same modality, can do, you still can do text to, te to text to text, but you can go beyond and do cross-modal ap application. Uh, in uh, neural search, you have the data, but you don't have the relationship between the data. And you infer your relationship that you have from your, for your model uh, understanding of the world, and you're trying to find your data. Um, 
Then there is another application that you can do with um, our framework is uh, DALI and Diffusion, and in, gen in general, it's like more generative arts. So I bet you have he uh, heard about, about this, but you can like um, give a sentence, give a, a prompt, a text prompt, and, you can and, and the AI will be able to generate an image for you. Uh, so this, is, this has been created by, by DALI last year, um, DALI supported by OpenAI, and this is the first model that has been able to do such a thing. And then there is DALI 2, which came out this year, uh, stable diffusion, which is a, even a, a new open source version of DALI 2, which is like uh, not even one month old, and she's like uh, making uh, making all, all of the news because it's cr it's like really powerful image generation with really good quality. Um, so let me give you such an example. So this is a, quer a query for uh, generative art. So ocean beach front view in a Van Gogh style. And this is generated by the AI. So this is not like retrieve for Google image or anything. It's like just generate based on the prompt. Another one, pa painting of a couple kissing a nebula. Well, you can see what the result. Um, and in general, understanding this DALI and this uh, generative art model is uh, pretty complex. For several reasons. First, it's based on a lot of state-of-the-art research and uh, like recent. Uh, it's ba based on like uh, breakthrough in NLP, um, in multimodal uh, machine learning when you like can combine uh, text and image uh, on this diffusion idea that I will present uh, right after, which is allow to have a model which understands things, but it can generate things as well. Um, but let me try to break it into small uh, an, an understanding. So first, to have this, uh, to, to be able to generate art from text, you need to have a model which can make the, um, the link between text and image. And it's basically trained on a lot of pair of text and image, and how he's able to have an understanding on what makes the text, why the text and the image are linked. So you have a model, like a clip-based model, which, which have this link, but it's not enough. You need a process to generate something out of it. And this is when diffusion uh, arrives. Um, di diffusion is a, so this is this process. So diffusion, you start from a beautiful image and you add noise, noise, noise. In the forward process, you add noise until you are to a completely noisy image. And the diffusion backward process will be the other way around. You start from the noise and you create something which makes sense. So you have those two steps when you go from image to noise, noise to image, and you train your network, you train your uh, AI machine learning model to do this forward and backward process. And at the end, what you are interested in it in is this, uh, this backward process. So you start with noise, and you can arrive to uh, an image which makes sense visually, at least for human. And you, and you guide this diffusion with your, 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 your query, your text query, to uh, you converge to an image which uh, makes sense uh, for human uh, visual cortex, but it it's makes sense with respect to the text query um, that you ask for. This is an, an example of how diffusion works in practice. So you see that at the beginning, it's completely noise, and step by step, it's converging into something which is uh, make, which makes sense visually, right? Um, let's sum up what is uh, Generative AI is deep learning powered content generation on multimodal data. Why multimodal? Well, you start with text, you go with image, but actually you can even start with image and go with image. So you have an application where you can like, like sketch, uh, a, 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 like a, uh, you can draw by hand something and you can ask your diffusion model to, to make it more realistic or like uh, to make it really beautiful. So this is like, um, um, text to image, image to text, and you can even in the future will be audio based diffusion when you can mix everything to create new content. In creative AI, you don't have the data, but you, are, you have the relationship, you have your text prompt, and you use your relationship to make the data, to create the data. Okay, so I introduced you two concepts neural search, creative AI. And actually, um, I like to see those two concepts as two faces of, of the same coin, um, which fall under the scope of multimodal application. So at the end, both of these applications, you have machine learning models that can handle multimodal data, text, image, audio, whatever you want. 
just in neural search, you don't have the data, but you have the data, sorry, but you don't have the relationship, and you find the data with the, with the model understanding. In creative AI, you don't have the data, but you do have the relationship, and you make the data. But at the end, it's still multimodal application. And multimodal is kind of the future of machine learning and AI in general. And it's not only me saying that, but all of the big tech company and all of the uh, best uh, research lab in AI are actually going into working on multimodal. Uh, OpenAI, DeepMind, um, uh, Facebook or Meta AI, Google, both of, uh, all of them publish some uh, multimodal uh, machine learning model in the last, in the last year. Um, and actually, there is, a, there is a reason which makes that uh, multimodal is the future. And this is a quote for Yann Le Kuhn in a recent blog post from a couple of weeks ago when he says that an artificial intelligence system, trained on words and sentence alone, will never approximate human understanding. And that's, that's really important to, to understand is like, what he tried to say here is like, you can give all of Wikipedia, all of the book in the world to an AI, it won't be able to be as good in understanding as, as, as a human. And it's kind of easy to understand why. Because when he's going to read a, a book which is going to describe what a horse looks like in real life, it will have a hard time visualizing everything and understanding uh, actually what's happening in the book. Because it will be only word. It can describe with word, but it will be, won't be as precise as with a uh, with visual cortex that you can have at the same time. And so if you really want your, uh, your AI to really understand the book, he needs to see horse in real, he needs to have image of horse just to visualize what it is about. And this is, this is why if, you, if we want to create AI which can approximate human understanding or at least be better than what we have right now, we need to go to the multimodal. And we need to mix image uh, with text and even video to understand how the world, what the world is about. And at Gina AI, we have the same, uh, and, uh, we have the same belief that multimodal is the future, and that's why we are bu building a MLOps framework for neural search and more generally uh, multimodal AI. And um, uh, fun fact, actually, we, we, we started to build this, this ML framework with neural search, but in order to solve building every kind of neural search application, we kind of have to go into being able to do any kind of multimodal AI. And that's why we ended up with this ML, of ML framework, which initially was based for neural search, but right, right now is way more powerful and can serve any multimodal AI application. Uh, let me uh, tell you more in depth about our uh, tech stack uh, that we will be using later uh, in the hands-on and in the workshop. So we have uh, different layers. So to build um, application, AI application and multimodal um, application in general, there are like a lot of layers of abstraction, right? And Agina will decide to expose uh, three concepts, three different layers to the user, to let them have full flexibility, but yet making it easier for them to develop. So we have like uh, the data concept documents that I will talk uh, right after. We have the logic concept executor when we basically let users define their own custom logic for creating their own application. And we have the orchestration layer when you can like um, take together all of the uh, logic to create a final application. Uh, so as I said, we have this document concept. Uh, document, we have an open source library which is called uh, Docker Ray uh, for document array. This is, our, this is a data structure that is uh, that is going to flow um, to, to go into each of the application. And executor, I just say what is ours. It's like uh, just function or classes which will take document as, as input and send back documents. And then you have flow um, that will, you will, a flow is just um, um, a graph of um, executor and document will flow through this flow, will flow, will go through this flow and, and that's how we create an application. Uh, with Dean. Um, I will, so this is, um, I, I will go over this uh, small piece of code to explain you the concepts from a Python uh, point of view. So first, you have to, of course, install Gina, but um, um, once it's installed, you can, uh, you, you have to import four objects. A document array, executor, flow, and request. So first thing that we want to do to build an application is to create the logic. What is it going to do this application do? And to do that, we create uh, an executor. It's in Python to create an executor, 
you, you just need, need to uh, 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 um, create a class which will inherit from this executor, executor which, which is coming, coming from our package. And, and once it inherits with that, so basically these classes, classes will, will not, not be only a Python classes, but it will be um, a fully microservices, that and th that th his lifetime will be handled by, by Gina. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, then, then you need to define the actual logic. logic. So you create uh, a method, uh, you decorate it with request to say to the executor that this is what you want to serve, and then you add your logic. So here the logic is really simple. You take a document as input and you add uh, a text to the tag, uh, to the text uh, uh, tag. So with this, you have uh, not only a class, but it's better to see it as a microservices, which will be able to run in the cloud and server application. Now that you have your microservices, you need to put them together into a consistent application and what we call the flow. And with this syntax, for example, we are adding two of these executor in a chain, so we have this, we have a graph with two of the same executor which follow each other. But this, this is an, an easy example, but actually you can build, you can represent any kind of application and any kind of, uh, of directed uh, acyclic graph. So any kind of graph, you can, we have a syntax to create a lot of a different graph to serve any kind of application. And then once your flow is ready, uh, you need to serve it and using the client to send a document array, um, to send document array and to send your document, you send your data to the logic. And this three lines of code, it actually starts of, um, a, um, an API which uh, 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 microservices based API, API which, which will serve your executor uh, and put your, your document, document to the to the logic. So let's, let's see in action how it's working. working. So, so I'm starting, starting the, the and you can, can see, see that, that the flow is ready to serve, serve and we send the, the we send the data and we have the results. Okay, so. This, this is, is on, the, on the right, this is with Gina, on the left, this is like, let's say, with traditional Python, and you can ask me, so why do we need to, what, what is the benefit of using the Gina to do such a thing? And what is the benefit of adding this real new line from the Python code? Actually, you have a lot of, a lot of benefits. First, um, you, can, you can have replication, sharding, scalability. Each of your executor is a microservices, you can scale it. Um, you have a duplex, duplex streaming. So uh, you, you don't, it's, not, it's not only HTTP, but you can talk with uh, gRPC and you can have a duplex streaming when you can send your data and receive your data. You have async, not blocking, data processing. Uh, our application is polyglot. You can, if you want to use gRPC or WebSocket or HTTP or even GraphQL, you can. It means that you can send different kind of requests or you can define if you, if you want to you have a front-end which talks HTTP with the application, you can. If you want to use WebSocket for a video game engine, you can. Everything is based on microservices architecture and uh, on the core containerization which wraps the executor. And we have a Kubernetes seamless integration, so it's easy to deploy to the cloud. Um, you can have observability by Prometheus and Grafana if you want to do monitoring. We have like a lot of default uh, metrics so that you don't have to add anything new. And we have a hub plugin ecosystem. You can reuse executor for other people that are already built it and you just need to pull it and pull it into your application. Okay, so now that I, so uh, I, once the tutorial will start or like the hands-on, uh, we will try to create a small application we are with our tech stack and we want to create an application which is called DaliFlow and it will be allow you to generate some uh, piece of art. Um, quick fact about DaliFlow, as I said, it allows you to generate uh, some art and uh, it's a client server architecture. It combined DALI and Diffusion using Gina, and it was around 300 lines of, of Python code and 400 lines of, of YAML. And it was actually a weekend of work well, for our CEO, which is can do a lot of things in one weekend, but uh, still it was one weekend project. Um, so today we're not directly going to build uh, DALI flow, but we're going to build a flow which is a bit uh, simpler so that we can do it live. And it will be a flow which consists of two steps. The diffusion step, when you send some text and you generate an AI, and an upscaling step, 
uh, which, which take, take your image and put it into a high quality image, image like, like uh, you can use it for the wallpaper, for wallpaper for, for, if you want. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, not sure, sure about the F-scatter, if we're going to have time, we will see at the end, but we will focus on the first time in the diffusion. Um, so, so we are we about to start uh, the, the demo, demo, but do you have um, any question before we open our laptop and start to do some coding? Well, you can think about the question and I'm going to open uh, different my day. Um, so, so for the one who have a laptop, laptop and he, who, who want, want to experience, experience the coding in live, um, please go to this link. Actually, I prepare a QR code, but since you can't scan QR code with your laptop, it won't be helpful. So you can go to uh, uh, my github, github.com slash sanja. I will let you a little bit of time to uh, connect to it. If you need, please ask me if you need the link again. Uh, I will open it. And you go to my repository, and this is the first one, Stable Diffusion Executor, and just click on this one. And this is the link that we are going to use to build everything. And we have a Google a notebook a, a hosting on Colab, so you don't need to do anything, just click on the notebook. Uh, and you will be able to run it from your browser, so without having anything uh, installed. Um, okay, this is a notebook. I will let you some time to go over, uh, just to open it. In the meantime, I will just show you the final results that we, uh, that we want to have, just to give you some You don't, you don't need, need to do this step, it's only me. So this is just the, fi the final thing that we want to build, and I just want to give you some insight and some, uh, some idea what it's going to look like so you will be eager to continue uh, and excited about building this application. Just installing dependency on Google Colab should be like a couple of minutes. Okay, it's installed. So now we are going to. So I have already a flow which is running. So as I said, flow is a fully fledged a microservices based application, and it's already running, I've already deployed it before uh, starting the workshop, but I just want to give you some hint on how, what, how, what it looks like. Um, okay, and I will need someone to actually give me a prompt if someone feels inspired, so that we can generate some art out of it. So if anyone has any idea of something he wants to see, uh, feel free to, to, to raise your hand and to try something. Well, don't, don't be shy, it's really going to be really funny to see you from going live. But I, I can give you some hints. You can, we can ask for a realistic photo of something. I don't know, something Linux-based since we are at the OSS event? Realistic photo of, I don't know, uh, uh, Linux Tux playing, I don't know, the guitar, for example. And let's take a look. Oops. Yeah, for good. One. Yeah. Sorry for that. Okay, so now I, I am in my, my Google Colab, but actually, as I said, the flow is running in the back, in like on, uh, on our cloud. So uh, Google Colab is just a client here, and we connect to the flow, and we could connect with, I don't know, an HTTP, a front-end uh, HTTP application. Um, and connect. And let's see the results. 
I hope, I hope it's going to be beautiful. Be beautiful. Uh, this is it's definitely not... not uh, oh, oh, I forgot the, 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 the Linux sticks. But, but this, this is, is uh, from uh, stable, stable diffusion, diffusion what, what uh, Chooks looks, looks like, like, what, what Linux looks like playing the guitar. guitar. So, so this, this, is, this, this has, has been generated, generated by the AI. AI. This is not, not like, like go on Google's image or search or something. Let's try with Tooks. I didn't, I didn't try, try this, this uh, query before, so I don't know what it's going to look like. like but but um, since, since we're going, going to build it in a couple of minutes, we'll be able to have as much time as you want to actually uh, uh, do. OK, okay this, this is a Tux. Is a well, it looks like the Linux Tux uh, playing the guitar. I will be happy with, with yeah, I'm happy with this, with this one. So uh, this is kind of cool. I mean, you can generate image out of text. And let's see how you can actually build it with our solution. So, so for the, the one who want to follow uh, the live part of the workshop, if you have the notebook open, we can go step by step and look at. Well, so I will introduce different concepts in Jena, and then we're going to actually build the application. So, for, um, so before we start, be sure to, you, to, to change runtime to GPU. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to generate anything. So know, know that, that you have your runtime, runtime based, so, so I repeat, repeat runtime, run change runtime, run and you ask for a GP1. GP1. Okay. okay. So, so first step, step is to install dependency. dependency. So, uh, we, are we are going, going to install Docker and Gina, which is coming from us, and, and uh, Diffuser and Transformer, which will help us uh, actually doing the machine learning part of the Diffusion. So, again, it will take a couple of minutes to install the dependency. If it's complaining about Gina Cloud, just remove the Gina Cloud from the PIM install line. Yes, go ahead. So just so I repeat the question for the people joining live. So the question is, is it generating the image or searching the image using uh, neural search, right? So no, it's on the examples that I just showed you, it's generating the image from the text. So this image does not exist on the internet. It just created, like, opening, like if someone was opening Photoshop and actually doing the same. Does it make sense? Um, OK, so everything is installed. And so we, we are going to start with our first concept in our Gina tech stack, which is a document. So document is a data, our, our data structure for unstructured data. And this data structure allows you to work with uh, different kind of modality, uh, text, audio, image, uh, whatever you can think about, and kind of have like a, a common API to, 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 to work with your data. And uh, it's fully, uh, it, this data structure is meant to be streamed, uh, over the over the overflow, overflow, so it's like uh, you can send. This is like the, um, the requests that will be sent to your flow. It's not only a data structure, but it's a thing that will be go over your, your executor. And it's basically, if you know document array, this is like the entry point to our tech stack. But it's like all you need to know almost. Once you know how to work with document, you can build any applications that you want. Um, so this is an example of how you can um, create a document. So you can, for example, pass a text and you create a document with a text. Um, you can as well have a document which contain an image, um, which contain a, sorry, a URI, so a URL. So we, and, and, and then you can load uh, this, this image from the network through your document array. Uh, by calling this load URI to image tensor, which is a helper function, and we have like a lot of helper function with all kind of data to make your life easier. And as you see, we loaded uh, NumPy and DRI into a tensor, um, and you can actually display uh, this image that you pull from the internet. And I choose a Linux Tux uh, image since we are at the OSS uh, uh, workshop. 
so you see that this document as a tensor object, it's actually where the image is stored uh, in uh, the document. And it's you can check this, this shape. And um, so uh, you can act you can add uh, tags, uh, sorry, tags to your data, so you can kind of customize it, uh, add some custom tags. So here are kind of documents. Uh, with a hello world text, but the tag is like the event has been done at the opposite. And I have kind of a different document from, from, coming from different sources with different tags, and my executor, my, my, uh, my business, my, my logic uh, layer will be able to deal with it differently. Okay. Uh, then you have, you have the concept of document array, which is just a list like container for documents. And actually, you are not directly sending documents, but document array when using Gina, and it's just a collection of documents. So to create document array, uh, you would just need to pass a list of documents uh, to, your, to the document array uh, classes, and it will create a document array. So let's do that. And that's what a document array looks like. So we have this interface, a CLI interface, or like not CLI, but a UE interface, which help you understanding what's happening in the document array. And uh, we, for example, in, in this document array, we have 12, uh, 12 documents, and um, they, have a they all have have this common attribute, which, attribute, which is a UE. And this UE is uh, actually uh, the Linux text image again, so you can, like, this is kind of the kind of helper function that we have to work with this container-like uh, data structure. Okay, uh, this is all for uh, document array and uh, so our doc array uh, data structure. So just to sum up, it's our data structure and you can send it on the wire to our uh, logic and uh, to, our, to the executor. Okay, so now that we understand what's, what is Docker let's go over what is Gina. So Gina is the name of our company, but it's first the name of our open source uh, project, um, which allows us to create applications. This is our MLOps framework for neural search and multimodal. And so let's create a really small application, uh, which is going to take some empty documents and add uh, uh, text. In this case, Gina is fully open source. Um, so to do that, again, we create uh, an executor um, we, we, do, we inherit from, uh, from the executor class from Gina. We just have this request which says that uh, this is like basically, um, you, can, you can see this interface as like um, a fast API of Flask or any kind of web framework. When you can like have a logic and have um, an entry point in each, it's going to how to serve this, this, this logic. And in, in, our, in our case, I want to serve uh, this full function was with this pass uh, on the on, on the root level of uh, my microservices. Um, so now that we have this uh, executor, we can actually uh, serve it into a flow. So here I'm creating a flow which is really simple. It has only this uh, logic layer in uh, in the application, and I will send some. Um, I will send some documents, so you can see here on this root level, so it's going to go to this one. I will say I will send some documents which the text is empty, and I will retrieve it in an other document array. So let's take a look at it. So here you see that before it was like waiting, it was waiting for the, for the microservices to actually uh, start. And in CERN, it sent the microservices, so for a couple of seconds it was actually serving a gRPC application, on the this port of my machine, or like the Google Collab one, and since I only want to do one action, one post, it's uh, stop right after. But it's not. This is not only calling Python applications. This is like uh, serving the microservices um, and sending uh, uh, a gRPC call to it, or it could be an HTTP one as well. And what do we have here? Uh, a document where the text is Gina is fully open source. So the document was empty at the beginning and went to the executor has been executed, no, not executed, has been processed, and we have the text. Um, so as I said before, uh, we can actually create way more complex applications than just uh, one executor, and we have this, so we have this Python um, interface which allow you to create any kind of, of, of DAG application. 
Uh, so, uh, so the, the, like a uh, uh, graph, graph application. application. So for, for example, example, here we can chain two executors, executor, one, one after each other. other. And, and in this case, case when you're going, going to send one uh, document, document, it will go over the first, first one and then go to the second one. one. Or you or can you have like a more complex, complex uh, one, um, <coughs> when you have like, like two branch, branch and, and you can specify different endpoints to create different logic. Okay? And, and now it's time for us to create, to create uh, the generative AI part uh, of the. Um, so, an exec so we need to create an executor which is going to take text as input and create some image. So I will show you how we can do such a thing. So first we need. So first we need, as I say, to create. Um, uh, a class, class is which inherit from executor. We need, we need an init function. function. For, for, for the, the moment, moment, we, we won't do anything, anything in the init function, function but, but later, later we will load the model and everything. So the, the generate, generate function, function it takes a docs, docs as input. Inputs. And a parameters when you can specify some things. Um, so in our case here, we are going to um, uh, so here we're going to for each document in the document array, we are going to do some things with the text. And so um, So this is the, ba the, the first basis of our um, uh, executor, and now we need to actually uh, load uh, the stable diffusion model and um, code the generate function. So let me just look over. Uh, I already code the executor. Just going to copy by this line because I tend to forget uh, the model name. So we are going to load this diffusion model from the stable diffusion pipeline from the uh, diffuser. Uh, it's like uh, open source library which, which allow you to work with generative uh, with generative art. So first thing that we need to do is to yeah, load this diffusion model and put it into our CUDA just so that we can use a GPU. Um, we might need to have this out token uh, which is just to take uh, just a, a, a text token uh, which allow, allow me to, to download the, the weight. Um, when you are going to run it, you might need to, they will tell you that you need to um, accept um, the weight. Uh, you, are, you need to accept um, a chart. The people that develop the model want you to accept a chart to use the weight. So that you don't do. Um, you, don't, you, you have to respect what they want you to do with this model. Um, okay, so uh, let's actually instantiate uh, this executor. So I will just copy past my old token. In a So it will download all of the weight, so it's around like uh, more than five giga of uh, uh, matrix weight. And in the meantime, let's go over uh, actually coding, um, actually coding the, the, the generation part. So uh, let me, I will just copy past this part and I will go over, I think it will be quicker. I won't lose your attention by doing this. 
Um, so, um, so I still have my generate uh, method, which wrap my request uh, endpoint. And for um, for each of the document which are in my doc in my document array, I'm generate one image from the document. And what what I'm doing is really simple. I'm taking the doc I'm taking the text and I'm calling this uh, diffusion uh, uh, model, and it's going to generate um, some uh, some image. And then. For each uh, generated image, I will uh, create a document. I will create a document, and on the tags, I have the original text. Uh, I have the name of uh, like which executor, which model did actually create. This is just a custom tag tags when, you, when we retrieve the document, you know where it's coming from. And I have a PIL image, so like a, a Python image, and I'm putting it into a data URI that I can be sent over the wire. And uh, in my original document, uh, in the match, match is, is a nested uh, part of a document which can contain other documents which are relevant to the original document, and I'm adding the generated document which contains image. So, let's again. I have some indentation issue. And I forgot to import torch. Okay, now I should be good to go. And again, it might take a couple of seconds to retrieve uh, the DOM load weight. So if you, if you didn't follow exactly the different step, you can go into the initial link that I sent to you, and you can find this executor.py object, uh, where I already coded this executor, and you can uh, see the code source and uh, reuse it if, if you want to. OK, go ahead, sorry. Uh, actually, no, the type in are not important since we are working uh, with uh, Python, but I just put it here to make it clearer what the, what the, func like what the executor is uh, awaiting, what kind of object it's awaiting, what kind of object it's awaiting. Then we have to implement least specific variables, right? And then could our API take parameters? Your executor would only, only take document array, and you have these parameters when you can pass like some keyword-based arguments. Uh, but the input is always document array. And but since our, we, we created the data structure, since so that we can um, easily work with any kind of data, and uh, so that's the point of the executor. It's like we have a common interface for all of the data that we send. We don't have to like have an image object or text object or an audio object. You only have this document array object. Which one? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, so this is just for compatibility reason. So our um, executor take um, can take uh, when, when when the flow is going to instantiate the executor. It might be in some case pass more than one than those two executor than those two parameters. Sorry. So, so I just put it here for, uh, like, like say, let's say, safety reason. And it, exactly, exactly. So now that we have our executor working, we can actually 
We can act actually start the flow with this executor and uh, send some document and generate some image again. So this one will actually be work working from the Google Colab. Um, So I will start a flow which only have this executor uh, for now, and I will I will I will do a query on the application which has been created, and I will do a query on this on the on the root branch since I asked here for to be served on the root level, and as input I will just pass a document or document array. with document inside, which has just have text with a query. So let's have a fancy query here. Um, the Linux text uh, doing something this time. With a red hat, oh amazing. <laughs> Um, and we just retrieve here in this document. So let's see how it's going to how it's going to work. So here, uh, it's going to actually, um, as, as I say, it starts this um, this executor in like this own uh, microservices, and it's going to send to be sent over the wire. So here is still local, but I will show you right after how you can actually deploy it on some on some cloud. So it's going to process yet again it's live, so I hope it's going to work. I didn't make any typo or something. Um, yes. Um, yes, I didn't explain, sorry. To get the O token, you need to go to the um, Hugging Face uh, Stable Diffusion model, where, and you need to, uh, if you go to this link, so the link will be on the readme of the first link I sent you to. And you can, if you log in and you accept the condition here, you will get the token that you can copy past uh, in your, yeah. Well, I think he's not happy about something. Uh, Okay, don't have, I don't want to go into the debug. I think my runtime is not uh, working properly. Uh, well, I take two zeros to do it in live. Uh, but no, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe the, the GPU that Google could have given me too small for handle the model. Anyway, this was the, the, the um, this was the life part. Hopefully, I did um, I, as I as I showed you before. I already um, um, I already deployed uh, the application. So uh, now I will show you how you can actually deploy. It. So we create an executor, and now I want to, uh, we, we 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 make it work on on the Google Cloud. Let's try to deploy it to the cloud. So. Um, to, de to deploy it to the cloud, I will go just going to uh, create an executor and to push it to our uh, Gina cloud. So let's just create uh, an executor folder, go into the folder. So we, ju we first need to do to install uh, Gina. Um, we just, we just first need to install Gina from, from, from the pip common. So pip3 install Gina. Once, Once this is done, done we, we can, can call, call directly the Gina package and we can create, create hub. Uh, so, so here, here we're going to create, create a new executor. executor. So this, this was, was from the code, code from, from the, the from the Python, Python interface. interface. Now we're going to actually create from the CLI so that we can push it to our cloud. So, so I will call it 
uh, another stable diffusion executable. And I will just put my name uh, so that we don't conflict with an existing one. And I want to create in this folder, yes. Um, so this, this step is actually really important. So here I just show you the Python step. But here we are going to do more than Python. It's going to uh, containerize this application into a Docker container. And um, uh, who is saying the Docker container is saying Docker file, and we actually have a couple of templates for Docker file that you can reuse. And especially in, your ca in our case, we want a Torch uh, GPU uh, template. Um, Short description, a small diffusion model. Um, image, so it's image and text. This is just some description so that you can find it on the hub. What is real for the repo, I don't want to precise one for now. So what you can see here is like we created, uh, maybe it's too small. We created this, fo created this, uh, this folder and which contains the application. So now what we're going to do is just um, uh, actually, um, copy past the code that we just wrote into uh, the executor so that we can push it to the cloud. So I'm just going to do a sh shameful copy pasting. And I just need to rename. And we're good to go. Okay, so now we do have our um, executor ready. In the, requi we, we, in the requirements, um, we will need to add diffuser and transformers as requirement. Let me just check that I didn't do any uh, misspell because I'm the king of misspelling. Okay, okay. Well, good. Okay, okay so, so now our executor is ready to be pushed to the hub. No, for, I, I, I need to precise uh, the path. So, so Jira hub push. I don't know what I wrote before, I must have done, done misspell again. So, so what, what is going in this step? What is happening is we're pushing the executors that we just wrote to the to the, the Jira hub. So our hub is just um, a place when a lot of people push different executors, and you can pull a push uh, like on GitHub, basically. Um, if you are not logged in, it might ask you to log in, and you can do it by doing Jira login. But since I'm already logged in with my uh, account. Um, so it might take a couple of minutes uh, to actually uh, build um, the Docker container and push it to the hub. So in the meantime, what I'm going to show you um, is how we can deploy it. So today I talked about uh, Docker Ray and Gina, or uh, two open source uh, projects, but we, are, we are actually have a self project. Um, which allow you to, to, to yeah, it, this is our, our, our cloud when you can actually send the flow and, it, and we will deploy it for you and manage the lifetime for you. Uh, we have a free uh, cheer for everybody who want to try out. Now, today we use uh, the free cheer to actually uh, deploy the application of our cloud. And uh, at the beginning, I show you some image generation on, and I told you um, uh, this is actually already deployed. And you can see here we have this. Uh, we have yeah, this uh, URL, URL. It's actually it's, it's, and it's pointing to an application that I deployed on our, our, our cloud uh, this morning, early before uh, joining the, the workshop. So to do this, we uh, are going to use um, we are going to use the um, another way of defining flow in Gina. I do not talk about it that much. 
uh, uh, I focus on the Python, Python interface, but we actually have a, a YAML, YAML interface which uh, mimic exactly the, py the Python one, and it allows you to, um, to s so you can create gen application like uh, uh, um, uh, um, interface for code. So um, and, and it's like in, in Kubernetes when you work with YAML, and you can as well here work. Um, with YAML. YAML. This is actually a really small uh, uh, YAML. YAML. It's just saying that we have a flow and we're using uh, this diffusion and the uh, executors that I just push. And I'm just passing my token uh, so that it can actually pull the weight. And what I'm going to do is to uh, deploy this flow. So gcloud, uh, you need to do uh, pip install uh, gina cloud and it's going to install the uh, gcloud GC, GC just, just uh, an alias, alias but uh, it's, it's actually working, working for everybody. everybody. Uh, no, no need, need to uh, update your bash or anything. anything. And, and GC, GC deploy, deploy flow user channel, it's look like AWS CLI or GCP CLI, and you can uh, deploy your, um, your flow. So again, I will start deploying my flow. Uh, it's take, it usually takes around um, between 5 and 10 minutes because I think I have some issues with connectivity, uh, but um, it's actually deploying on our Kubernetes cluster, it's assigning um, a new UI, uh, and it's assigning the certificate that you can use uh, uh, SSL when connecting to the flow and being fully protected and, and loading, of course, all of the weight of the model. Uh, so, so I will keep this as a backbone process, process and we will take a look again, again. but uh, uh, while uh, well I'm pushing the executor and I'm uh, building the flow, and in the meantime, uh, let's do some content generation uh, to wait. So again, this is like the flow which is already running, and in the meantime, uh, let's actually do a more uh, generation. So who has another offensive prompt that he want to try? Is there that one again, maybe? That we didn't have a chance to look at uh, with the Red Hat. So let's do the same one with the Red Hat. We'll see how it's going to react. Okay, so. What was my sentence? A realistic photo of Linux Duke playing the guitar with Red Hat. Okay, maybe I should have said Red Hat somewhere else. I think he, understand, he didn't understand the red part, the hat part of the red hat. Linux Duke with the Red Hat playing the guitar. Where are we? Okay, let's try. Kind of scary. Uh, he only kept one eye of the of the Linux, uh, uh, but but he understands the red hat uh, more than the red hat. He put a lot of red in the photo, but anyway, um, let's look at. Uh, so our um, executor is still in a building process, and our flow is still in a deployment process. And it's failing again. Um, I do believe I have some connection issue connecting to our uh, API. So we won't deploy it live. And I think that it will mostly be uh, the end of the live workshop since um, and we dip and since we can't really deploy the flow since because of some um, issue. Um, but if you have any question about um, all of the different steps that I showed you, and uh, feel free to ask. Go ahead. Uh, so I repeat the question. So the question is, is it mandatory to deploy on the our cloud or can you self-host it? Um, of course you can self-host it. As I said at the beginning, um, the Gina open source uh, 
uh, package can have sim seamless integration with Kubernetes. So what you can do actually is to, from a flow, you can have you can you have a helper function which help you to create the Kubernetes YAML file, and then you can deploy on the Kubernetes cluster. Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So one, one of the things that we see today here in the in the lab, we always see that Sally uses a uh, syntax that always is a flow open and then sends something to the flow. So this is a kind of like a uh, it's a flow open that is actually running on the host machine. So it's not like it's not like a host machine that has a host machine. So this is like open on the host machine. So this is like open on the host machine. So this is like open on the host machine. So this is like open on the host machine. So this is like open on the host machine. So this is like open on the host Flow like this because the flow is like a service. And then you have a time. We have many times, not just one time. So in this case, it makes a very strong assumption that flow has the same lifetime, the server has the same lifetime as the client. Because when the server dies, the client also dies. And also, it makes another strong assumption that there is only one time to each server. Because here, you only have one time. Client of host, right? Client of host. But in reality, in practice, there is one server. It could be, it could have millions of clients sending requests to this, uh, to this host. So therefore, uh, in production, when you deploy this on uh, the database on GitHub, right? So uh, you kind of have have this flow as independent flow only, right? And then all the clients that you can connect to that host, not only just one. So this is more realistic uh, uh, scenario. So, uh, okay, so you said that it builds you the Kubernetes model for you to deploy yourself. So, uh, so I repeat the question again. So you say that it's, um, so we have a helper function to create the Kubernetes YAML function, and your question is, can we create as well the Docker image? So the question is yes, and actually when I'm doing a Gina hub push, it's pushing, pushing the executor, the executor and it's like pushing, pushing the code. But at the same, same time, we have like a normalized normalize normalize step, step, which is going to take the, the Docker file and build the Docker image. image. And then and you can, can reuse it uh, in your uh, Kubernetes file, file or a local, local Docker development. Docker image is automatically used on demand. It's more like that just a sophisticated. We have this part, and then we have this part. So the part is not like a static. Which allow you to spawn more replica of the executor if you have a lot of uh, high demo. 
Oh, so I'll still have to modify the YAML file to scale. Well, this is an option, right? Um, by default, we do not activate auto scaling, but yes, if you want, you can modify the YAML file to, to add auto scaling. If you don't care about money, then, then, then you, can, you can set auto scaling to true. <laughs> by default, yeah. That by default, <laughs> right? You know, how, however traffic you have, then it will auto scale on, on demand. But then it will take a lot of money. People usually don't want to set an upper bound, saying that, okay, up to three machines, up to three, up to three GPUs. Especially if we're not talking about this, this workshop is about multi-modality, multi-model applications. Uh, a lot of multi-model applications require GPU. So you don't really want to auto-scale a GPU. Right. Um, otherwise, your business will go bankrupt before you, <laughs> before you kind of like become famous. We've got a question from a virtual attendee. Um, what is the difference between display with in parentheses from equals tensor and just display parentheses with nothing. Yeah, good question. Should I repeat? Uh, yeah. So yeah. just repeat the question: What is the difference between? Uh, um, so here, what is the difference between dog display without anything and dog display of tensor? So this is a good question. In this example, we have actually. Uh, two, uh, in the document is composed of the two things, the tensor and your URI, and I just saying that I want to display from tensor, uh, and not from something else. So here, it will, also was, it, will, it, it will be like, uh, he didn't know what to do between using URI and tensor, and he can actually plot from both, and I just told him to plot from tensor. Yeah, so do we have more questions? Otherwise, Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, so for the Gina Cloud, uh, do you guys have your own infrastructure, or you guys are using uh, some other uh, third, um, third party infrastructure? To um, we, we are relying on, on a different provider, um, especially for uh, managing of Kubernetes cluster. But we do have our own infrastructure on this cloud, and we are uh, we add all of the layer to make it uh, easier for people to deploy the flow. And we manage our life cycle. And uh, we have, like, for example, a couple of uh, Prometheus and Grafana instances. And we, uh, and we automatically generate a link for people to look at the metrics of the deployed application. Uh, yeah, I, I asked because I want to know where the data will be. Because, like, uh, for certain applications, uh, uh, auditors require that you know exactly where the data is. And so I wanted to know. Yeah, well, I want to make a point here. So. For now, the J Cloud that we offer is running on our own cloud, but we are working to have this so that you can use the J Cloud self-hosted in your own cloud so that you have control over your data. And this is something that we are working on to offer our users and clients to have the J Cloud advantages on your own cloud with under your own control. But for now, it goes on our on our on our um, cloud providers. But we are working to make it available for. So we do, no, we do have a buffer. I didn't go into in detail too much uh, today, but later we have another talk what we're going to do in, in detail technically how uh, the microservices architecture is working. But to give you uh, some uh, some details, we have like a gateway object. So each time we deploy a flow, we have a microservices for all of the executor, but we have like a gateway object, which can be replicated as well, which is work as a buffer. And it will work as like uh, controlling the request uh, in the start waiting rate, and it's going to, so if an executor is still like uh, in processing some other request, it will throttle and wait. Uh, and we are based on, 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 on the GFPC connection everywhere. In GFPC we have this dual streaming interface when we can, act, we, it's like built in a GFPC so that we don't say send too much request while it's still processing. But we have this, uh, yeah, this gateway we can serve as a buffer. So until the gateway dies because you send, like, like uh, two, it's go out of memory because you send terminal requests, it will just wait 
uh, for, it will just wait for the executor to be able to continue the process. But since you can replicate the gateway, technically you can make it so you never lose um, any record. But then again, it's a cost of yeah. having a lot of replication. Does the gateway have strong identity? As in, uh, can you whitelist uh, certain IPs on the gateway? Or the gateway will respond to every request? So at, the, at the moment, our philosophy is more uh, for the gateway not to re-implement everything that exists uh, outside, and we will encourage you more to use some other kind of, of, of um, on, on top of our gateway, some, uh, for example, you can, uh, in our PG Cloud uh, cluster, we are using a Kong, Kong uh, which is another API gateway, which allows you to do this kind of whitelist, or, uh, of, um, uh, and doing, for example, if you want to add something else, like uh, some authentication layer, or something like this, and you do it on top. But, but, but we are building actually and allow you people to build their custom gateway and implement their own logic, not only at the data level, the data processing level, but as well as the, uh, at the routing level. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I think it's all for the question. Um, thank you all for listening to me and uh, watching me doing uh, the live uh, workshop. Even if it uh, fails sometimes, but that's the risk of uh, live stuff. Um, yeah, thank you very much.